Hey, thank you all for being with us again today. I'm your host, Nathan Crane, and today we are joined by Howard Martin, the Executive Vice President of Strategic Development at HeartMath. In 1999, Howard co-authored The HeartMath Solution, a leading book about the heart's intelligence. Howard's a member of the Transformational Leadership Council, founded by Jack Canfield, and he's a member of Evolutionary Leaders, founded by Deepak Chopra. Howard's been featured in movies like The Power of the Heart, The Matrix, and The Truth. Howard, thanks so much for being with us. Hey, Nathan. Thanks. Good to be with you again. Thanks for having me on the uh, Unify Summit. And I want to greet you as well, but also all the people who are listening, uh, wherever you are listening around the world, whenever you're listening uh, around the world. And I hope that uh, our conversation today uh, offers you something that you take forward into your life that makes your life a little bit better. So today we're talking about activating your heart's intelligence. Um, Howard, I had a fascinating conversation with you a few years back on another event we did that really opened my eyes to um, a much more profound scientific basis of actually uh, the heart having its own intelligence. You talk about this, you teach about it, you guys research it, and, and yeah. are really dedicated to this, the leaders in the field, if you will, about the heart's intelligence. So please, for all of our viewers, give us some background on what does that mean, the heart has its own intelligence. So you, so you want, want to jump, jump right, right in, in don't you? you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we think about it, you know, for thousands of years, the heart's been talked about as something more than a cardiovascular organ. Uh, some of the earliest writings of humankind referred to the heart as a source of wisdom, a uh, source of intelligence. Uh, as time went on through the process of medical reductionism, you know, in some ways, the concept of heart being more than a cardiovascular organ was beginning to get lost. In these times, what we've learned is that intelligence is actually distributed throughout our entire body. Uh, it's not just in the brain. It's right on down to every single cell in our body. There's intelligence throughout our entire system. But when we talk about heart intelligence, I probably want to talk about this in, in sort of two ways. One is the sort of the, the philosophical, emotional concept of heart intelligence and then the scientific understanding of it. If you think about it, uh, there are times in your life when you've reached deep inside your cells and you've touched into something that allows you to move beyond your challenges that allowed you to um, be more than your normal self, that gave you access to a part of yourself where you were the very best person you could be. That to me would be an example of accessing or feeling or bringing forward the intelligence of the heart. The intelligence of the heart is really high speed. It's intuitive in nature. It moves very quickly. It informs us through the ways in which we feel about things, the way in which we sense things. Um, it is an intelligence that gives rise to some of the feelings and emotional qualities that are the most important in our lives. And they would include um, love, compassion, kindness, appreciation, patience. You know, the list goes on of these emotional qualities that really are the highest qualities of humankind. And heart and the intelligence of the heart is what gives rise, in my opinion, to us feeling those types of emotions. And metaphorically, they've been linked to emotion, I mean, to heart for for a long, long time. So to me, what I've learned about the intelligence of the heart is it's there. It's something I can refer to, something I can access on an ongoing basis. And what it does is it helps me make decisions, big and small. It provides an inner guidance system of how I navigate life. And if I try to do it just from logical, linear intelligence, just getting the facts and you know basing my decisions on facts alone, it doesn't seem to work out as well. But when I engage that other part of myself in combination with the logical linear mind, that's when I come into my maximum intelligence capacity. That's when I can be the very best Howard Martin I can be. I can communicate better, relate better, make decisions that I think come out with better results in the long run. All that happens when I'm in connection with my heart. We're always, uh, we always have that ability, isn't it? Heart intelligence uh, goes away from us. What happens, Nathan, is that we go away from it. Uh, through the roar of ambition and survival and the busyness of our days and the challenges and the emotions that go up and down and all around, they in some ways cut us off and we begin to live from the neck up. And when that happens, we lose a certain relationship to life. The quality of life diminishes. Uh, we don't feel as good about ourselves. We don't feel as hopeful about our lives, about the world. We certainly don't connect in as meaningfully with others as when we are in connection with the heart. 
So what I've just said is my own experience about that and some of the things that we teach in heart math training programs. And uh, at the same time, it's nothing new. It's been talked about for thousands of years, and just about every great teacher or writer has talked about heart in that type of a, of a context. Many years ago when we started heart math, uh, those of us that were – Working with Doc Childry, Heart Mass founder, we'd had these experiences. We knew there was intelligence there, and we wanted to share that in a way uh, with others. To do that, we recognized that we needed to position heart differently, that if we didn't, it would just remain in the realm of respective realms, actually, but realms of philosophy, spirituality, religion, and it would be written off. Uh, like it had been for a long time and not really applied with a meaningful intent that would allow us to experience all these benefits. We chose to build a bridge between what we feel inside sometimes about heart, what's been said about it philosophically, and modern day living. We chose science to be that bridge. And the reason science was chosen is that in our society today, science carries so much weight. Uh, when something is, is proven empirically, then it takes on another level of belief, and within the context of that belief, there's another level of effectiveness. And so science is a great bridge to, to try to understand heart in a modern way. So you alluded to it a minute ago when you were introducing me and introducing this topic about the rigorous amount of scientific research that we've done here at HeartMath. And I guess, you know, over time, over these 26 years, that's what we've become most known for is the science that we've done. Uh, I see heart math as a lot more than science, but I'm sure glad that we have that science. It's allowed us to move and weave through mainstream society in ways that we couldn't have never done if we didn't have a scientific underpinning to what we've done. And so we can talk about that some if you'd like. I want to break here and give you a chance to, to comment or ask other questions, but that is what I speak about. And the context of what we call heart intelligence here at HeartMath. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly relate. I'm sure many of our viewers can to um, having some of those deepened uh, heart-centered experience that you that you know you spoke about. I mean, there's um, certainly the more that we pay attention to that. I know that in my life, the more that I am aware of by making a decision from a space of, of one of those emotions associated or one of those you know energy fields associated with the heart that certainly the outcome in almost all cases is significantly better um, <coughs> or even if it doesn't seem better at first the end result later on is much better than than had I made a decision uh, otherwise maybe just from my mind and you know you don't really know either way but you can feel it and I think feeling is a significant indicator to um, what's really going on inside of us and certainly taking a look at the results but yeah I mean I'm really interested in the science I mean I'm um, uh, I really like uh, science as a bridge as a way to help um, uh, connect with people that normally otherwise you know wouldn't be into spirituality if they didn't have scientific uh, yeah. evidence to support them because um, I think it's important as just a, as a tool you know I mean like you said all the stuff science is, is uh, confirming now um, ha has been talked about for thousands of years. You know, our ancestors yeah. knew about all this stuff. They figured it out. They did the science inside themselves. They already yeah. knew. Now yeah. we're using machines and technology and stuff to, to try to catch up with the intelligence they had. But, um, yeah, I'd love to share, you know, for you to share some of, the, some of the, you know, scientific research that you guys have done in HeartMath and give another strong foundation. Well, let me confirm, first of all, a couple of things you said. First of all, yes, uh, emotion and feeling is everything. We are emotional feeling beings. That's how we turn life from into a visceral experience instead of just a dry, objective one. It's through the feelings and emotions, and heart and heart intelligence plays a big role in that and learning how to better utilize that emotional capacity. But you're right, the science is important, and it did, as I mentioned earlier, give us the ability to do a lot more societally than we would have without it. As an example, some things your listeners may not know, and I, I say this just to to offer as a gesture of hope, not to you know to be aggrandizing heart math, but we train. We've done training in lots of mainstream organizations. For example, uh, our partners in uh, the Netherlands are training all 40,000 Dutch police officers in heart math techniques. 
how do you get a contract with a Dutch police force unless you take it out of the spiritual uh, philosophical context? But Fortune 100 companies, large healthcare institutions, uh, government agencies, and the list goes on of places that we've been training, uh, and military. Actually, the, the, all four branches of the, of the U.S. military, um, we've trained in those places. So how do we do that? Well, we first wanted to understand the physical harm more. Uh, we knew we had these experiences. Uh, but we wanted to understand, you know, how they were happening. So we began to look at the physical heart and we found that the heart was a lot more than a cardiovascular organ. In essence, it's an information processing center in our bodies. What was also interesting in those early days is that some of that understanding, some of that research was actually already there. It was just peppered out in little pieces throughout the research literature. The dots weren't being connected, but it was there and people were picking up pieces of that story. What our researchers, Dr. Roland McCready and others, uh, did was really put that story together in a, in, a, in a context that could be shared, and it's provided so much more new understanding for literally tens of millions of people as a result of that. The story kind of goes like this, is that the heart is actually sending information to the brain and the rest of the body, and it does it in four ways. There are biological communications. One is a nervous system that exists in the heart itself. It's actually studied through a field called neurocardiology. That's an example of like, who knew that, right? That there's guys studying a nervous system in the heart. Uh, it's next to the brain. It's the most complex part of the nervous system that we have. So the first way we know the heart communicates is through this nervous system that exists within the heart itself that communicates with the high perceptual centers of our brain through a nerve pathway starting out in the heart and then traveling upwards. The second way is through what's called a blood pressure wave, the wave of energy created by the squeezing of the heart muscle that's pushing the blood through the veins and the arteries. Blood pressure wave modulates all the time depending upon how the heart is beating, and as it does, it changes biological functioning, including the electrical activity in our brains. And that's the third way is another one of the ways, uh, another one of those examples of information in the research literature, but no one knew about it. Uh, in 1983, the heart was reclassified as being part of our hormonal system, considered to be a cardiovascular organ and a hormonal gland because it produced a number of very powerful and important hormones. One of those, for example, is called atrial peptide. One of atrial peptide's jobs is to release, reduce the release of the um, stress hormone, cortisol. Heart also produces uh, a hormone many of you listening may have heard about, oxytocin. It's generic of oxytocin produced by the heart. Now, those first three ways, Nathan, are what I call hardwired biological communication pathways. Well documented, well understood, uh, hard science on all of that. The fourth way is where it gets most interesting, however, and that's the energetic communication. Our hearts are electrical organs. They produce by far the strongest source of bioelectricity in our bodies. The electrical energy produced by the heart permeates every single cell in our body. When we go to a doctor, for example, and they take in our electrocardiogram, what are they measuring? They're measuring an electrical signal produced by the heart. They look at that signal to determine. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The signal is strong enough that it creates an electromagnetic field. An electromagnetic field that extends out into space about three feet outside our bodies and surrounds us in 360 degrees. So the heart's creating this electromagnetic field that we are broadcasting that electromagnetic information into the environment that we're in, in relationship to each other, three feet outside of the body. That field goes through modulations and changes all the time. The frequencies in that field, the energy in that field changes. And what changes it is interesting, our emotions. If we're feeling frustrated, angry, irritated, something, we watch the news and something upset us, we're going to be producing an incoherent field. Conversely, if we're in a situation where we're feeling some extra kindness for someone, more compassion for someone who's going up through a hard time in their life or for the world or having appreciation for the good things in their life, those type of heart-based emotions create a coherent field, an ordered field. So the, the emotions are modulating the field. The field is changing all the time. We are broadcasting that information. So in a sense, we are literally broadcasting our emotions through this energetic field produced by the heart. 
But so the let, story, let me stop you right there real quick, Howard, because um, uh, when you talk about an incoherent field and a coherent field that the heart yeah. is creating within about three feet around us, um, can you share some examples of what an incoherent field might uh, might create or produce in you know our exchanges or our experiences? Yeah, certainly it's it would one thing is it would create a lack of sensitivity. You know, through that incoherent field where you have a lot of different frequencies competing for power, it's not a lot of order in the field, it's sort of chaos in the field. As we try to relate to other people, as we try to say, listen to them or understand them or really get a sense of their essence, a lot of that wouldn't be as acute with that incoherent field happening. Uh, conversely, when we're really in sync with ourselves, when we have heart and brain body communication operating at optimal levels, we're really coming from our very best place inside when that happens, then we're a lot more open. We're a lot more understanding. We see bigger pictures. We're not so myopically focused on a problem or judging someone for a fault. We have a more inclusive, more wholeness perspective on life in general, and that sets up a whole different set of potentials for us in the quality of that moment, the quality of the day, and the overall quality of our lives. Well, like in a real, real world example, you you may walk up to to a loved one or a friend or, or a spouse, and uh, maybe they're in a bad mood, right? Basically, they have an incoherent heart filled, is what you're saying. And you can walk up, you can be within three feet or five feet of them, and and immediately get frustrated, right? <clears throat> or immediately yep. have, uh, uh, they may say one thing that instantly triggers you, and now you react in a negative way. Yeah, and so what you're saying is you're tuning in, maybe un unconsciously, to the the field that they're transmitting. Yeah, and in some ways that's true. We become more sensitive to what they're transmitting. But what else? What's more important than that is the more coherent we are, the less other fields affect us. Meaning that, hey, that's when if you're really uh, coming from your true deeper heart place, then they say that thing, but it doesn't upset you as much. For me, uh, if I'm tired, for example, if I feel like I've worked really hard that day or whatever, it's much easier for me to get triggered. You know, I feel more depleted. You know, I'm not, you know, my game as much. I'm not as sharp in, in certain ways. And that, then a lot of times I'll lose my emotional poise quicker than when I feel more regenerative or more, you know, in sync. And that has everything to do with the vibratory rate. I'm using another term now, the vibratory rate in my mind and emotions. And that's all governed by the heart, by the intelligence of the heart. When I'm in a higher vibrational state, then I have that type of awareness that allows me to navigate through triggers and things that people say with more grace, with more poise. I become Captain Picard, you know, <laughs> I just kind of, you know, don't get ruffled by all that stuff. You've, uh, been, you've been able to measure this field, uh, this heart coherence field. You've been able to measure it uh, with, with scientific uh, equipment. Yeah, it's easy. It's actually it's very traditional equipment. It's called magnetometers. They measure electromagnetic fields. Uh, the other measurements that are more difficult to take are where the science is going today, where it gets more interesting, because we're measuring an electromagnetic field with magnetometers three feet outside the body. But what if that field extends a lot further? What if you measure something besides electromagnetic energy in consort with that? What if we are all connected and unified in a unified field of global consciousness uh, that's more difficult to measure? So the scientific inquiries we have today are around a couple of areas. One is around social coherence. What happens in large groups of people? How is social coherence created? And also the energetic connectivity that we believe occurs between all living systems, this planet and beyond, but that there's an energetic connectivity and within the context of that, that's how we learn to relate. It's important that we begin to develop new understandings about this because we are in a, such a shared society today. We all face not only our personal cha challenges, but societal and global challenges. Learning more from a scientific perspective about how we are all really connected in this, how we influence the outcomes for others, and how in turn we are affected by you know, the global field is important for us as we mature in the next level of human beings. Uh, to get on to these things and to develop a, a more sensitive, acute understanding of it, it puts us in a position of knowingness and also a position of self-responsibility, understanding that each and every every time we make a shift in ourselves, one way or another, you know, from chaos to coherence, there's an impact that it has on uh, the global field and in turn on every single living system on our planet. 
It's fascinating, Howard. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, everybody. When we get back, uh, Howard's going to share with us how intuition plays a role in the heart's intelligence. Uh, he's going to share with us a practice we can do to really activate our heart's intelligence, and we'll talk a little bit about the Global Coherence Initiative. So stay tuned. I have a couple quick messages for you, and we'll be right back. This weekend has been one of the most magical experiences of my festival career. I still feel like I haven't explored enough after three days, so it was awesome. It has been the most inspiring and heart-centered festival I have ever been to. All right, thank you all so much for tuning in. We're here with Howard Martin and um, uh, from HeartMath and sharing uh, some fascinating insights around uh, the heart that most of us, uh, you know, never learned all these other functions it has, including this incredible ability to create um, electromagnetic energy. And <clears throat> you know, my opinion, uh, or or my. Um, uh, I don't know, I guess theory you could say is that it, it creates even a lot more than just electromagnetic energy. And I think that's some of the things that you guys at HeartMath yeah. are really seeking to, to, um, to research and find out more about as well. But I'd love for you to um, talk a little bit about intuition and how you know, intuition plays a role in the heart's intelligence. Well, I think the best definition I ever got about intuition was from a woman who was cleaning a table next to me in a restaurant overhearing a conversation I was having with another person about intuition. And basically what she said was, is I know what intuition is. She says, it's knowing what you know without knowing how you know it. Uh, so there's a direct knowingness that it comes with intuition. There are different forms of intuition. And that's, you know, and sort of a, the most common form of it is this feeling we have inside of uh, which way we should go about doing something or not doing something. Um, you know, it's, it's a sensing. It's not even mental in most cases. It's, you mentioned it, I think, earlier when we were conversing about how we feel certain things and they're related to heart. Um, there's energetic sensitivities that are intuitive. A great example of that would be uh, you're standing somewhere and you feel like someone's looking at you. You turn around and they're staring right at you. You somehow felt it. There's an intuition, intuitional or energetic intuition that's there. And then another kind is called non-local intuition. That's when we have these knowing, we know something about something occurring with someone far, far away from us. It's not even bound by space or time. But yet we know, like the mother who realizes something's going wrong with her child, but she's in New York and the child's in Los Angeles and she calls up and says, the babysitter, you go look at the kid right now. The babysitter goes in, finds out the child's in some sort of very physical distress situation and saves the child's life, right? So these things happen. And that happens every day to so many people, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, every single, it's not like once in a while to a few people, like everybody has experiences like that at some level. Yeah, so with us in heart math, you know, in our training programs that we train in, in in companies, the ones we do in our coaching programs, a lot of the, the, the programs that we provide, the certifications we provide for people that want to teach heart math have an intuition module in them now. Intuition has become not only popular but important. Our approach to intuition is what we call practical intuition. 
how do we demystify this? How do we make it more easy and casual in our daily life so that it becomes part of how we live, not as some big experience that we have from time to time? It doesn't have to be a great invention when we experience intuition. It can be more like uh, knowing that it's time to bring that subject up or when it's not. Or knowing if I'm going to bring that subject up, which type of word should I use? That's intuition guiding us. You know, it can be things like who to hire. You know, in the United States, if you, any of you are listening outside of our country, you may be interested to know we have laws, labor laws here, where in a job interview, you can't ask personal questions. If I'm interviewing someone to work here at HeartMath, I cannot ask them, you know, about their health. I can't ask them how many kids they have. Uh, I can't ask them any of that. I can only ask very standard questions like tell us about a challenging situation you had in your last job and how you handled it. <laughs> you know, so I'm looking at resumes, you know, and I'm, and I'm only uh, legally uh, can ask uh, generic questions. How do you make the decision between people when the resumes look so similar? It's a feeling you get. That's practical intuition. You feel whether this person is going to be the best for the job is going to fit the culture, is going to be happy here. Those are the questions that you need to ask yourself, and the only way you determine those is through the feelings that you have. So we take intuition and we make it practical. We provide a context and understanding of what it is, and then some very simple tools and practices people do to cultivate it so that it be becomes, again, something that is applicable to our daily living, not some mystical experience. Uh, not something grandiose that we begin to see that intuition is really always there. You said a minute ago, well, this happens every day to a lot of people. Well, it's all around us. You know, intuition to me is a field of information that's always there. We learn to access this field of information and it draws in uh, new information in different ways. Again, direct knowingness. Uh, sometimes we just get a sense that we know something. And when we, we, when we follow that, it usually works out in our behalf. It doesn't go through all the checks and balances of, well, it's this and that and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That happens too. And sometimes we need to make decisions that way. Uh, a consultant that worked with me a number of years ago used to term with me that I really liked about business decisions. He told me to make my decisions based on informed intuition. It means you do get facts. You don't ignore facts. You know, you get an understanding. But then at some point, you have to make that decision. You have to call that shot based on something else, based on the, the facts alone do not give you the clear path. And so you have to make it on an inner feeling. People call that a gut feeling. And there is a sort of a, a very uh, primitive gut reaction that we have to things. But the real feeling that we have is not gut. It's heart. It's a heart feeling. And that's where heart intelligence comes into play. Heart intelligence and intuition are directly linked. Intuition is an aspect of heart intelligence. So intuition is a very popular subject now. I think part of it is uh, for two reasons. One is I believe that this, the problems to many of the, that we're faced with today, the challenges, let's put them that way, are bigger than any solution that we seem to be able to come up with. <laughs> so we begin to dig a little deeper because we can't get the answers the other way. I also believe that uh, in the evolutionary spiral of the changes that we're going through as a society now and as a, as a planet, that intuition is actually more available than it used to be. That field of information that I'm calling intuition has moved closer. So it's more in the air and people pick up on that. They're sensing that. So they're more interested in intuition because it's, it's available and also because they can't solve the problems that they have with the same type of logical linear uh, methods they used before. You know, one of my um, early, I would say, you know, mentors or spiritual teachers was uh, about 12 years ago. And, and I studied with him for, I think, over two years. And one of the things that, that um, he taught me that I really resonated with was... Um, you know, the field that you call the heart's uh, energy field around us, he called the mind field. And he called the mind field because of, um, he said that, you know, that's where all of our thought particles were stored, was in this field around us. You know, mm -hmm. the, the emotions, the thoughts, the, you know, the actual, our thoughts, he talks about them actually being particles. And, um, I mean, how do you guys, how do you look at that at HeartMath? If, if we're based on the premise that, 
we are all unified, that our, our heart's intelligence, this energy that obviously is much more than just uh, electromagnetic energy, if it's, yeah. if it's a way for us to communicate and to feel, there's obviously something much more going on there, um, and that we're talking about intuition, meaning we can access that information or that energy or that knowledge, that knowing it at any point, at any time through practice and through experiences that, that we've had, we know that we can access that at any time. And that perfect guidance comes every time. Um, you know, how do you guys at HeartMath look at that? What, what, how else do you see that energy in, inside? I mean, would you call it thought particles or what would you call that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of ways. That's a good way to characterize it. There's a mind field as well. I mean, heart is not, you know, the only thing. I'm just saying it's it's bigger than people realize as human beings. But we, we have a lot of different types of intelligence. There's a mind field. There's a heart field. They work together. They interface. There's a dance that's constantly going on between these fields. And they are, in a sense, less dense than we realize. So particles is a good way maybe to describe it, you know. What are they? Who knows at this point? But this this type of information is not is something that's easy to quantify. But I think what your teacher was picking up on is that there is information. It's like bits. You could, you know, in modern terminology, you'd be like computer bits. You know, uh, just like computer code. You know, that's out there. There's a lot of ways you could look at it. But what he's, what I think your teacher was saying, and what I'm saying is, you can de-densify these things. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so. Maybe you can share with us a um, a practice that uh, that maybe a heart math practice that we all can use to really activate our heart's intelligence. Yeah, I'd be glad to share a, a simple technique uh, with you in this medium. I do urge people to take a look more deeply at, at heart math as the heart math system. There's books. There are training programs for you. There's lots of things you can do to learn heart math and learn how to connect with the intelligence of your heart. But today, what I'd like to do, Nathan, is share a very simple technique that you can use on the go, anytime, anywhere, that reconnects you with something you already have inside your cells and can help you make a decision, big or small, certainly add a boost of energy and lift in your life during the day. It's called the quick coherence technique. Uh, what I'd like everyone to do now, if you can, is to focus your attention right here in the area of the heart. And if you want, you can put your hand there. But you can just feel as if the energy is moving from the head down into the area of the heart. And this is called heart focus. Now what I'd like you to do is to do what's called heart focused breathing. I want you to breathe naturally and normally, but deeper than you normally would. So nice deep breaths. And as you inhale, I want you to imagine as if the breath is flowing in right through the area of the heart, the area in the center of your chest. And then as you exhale, send it back out right through that same area. Now let's go to step three, heart feeling. Continue to do that heart focused breathing. And now what I'd like you to do is to activate a heart-related emotion. Maybe just feel the appreciation you have for the good things about your life. Or maybe you can feel the love or the care that you have for someone or something in your life. Those type of emotions. Don't force it. Make it a gentle process. Continue to breathe. Imagine your breath is flowing in and out through the area of the heart and just gently feel a heart-based emotion, heart-related emotion. Now continue to do that and I'll explain to you what's happening inside your body right now. Your autonomic nervous system, which controls about 90% of all bodily functions, is synchronizing. The neurological communication from your heart back to your brain is going into the higher perceptual brain centers and beginning to activate those brain centers. Hormones are being released into your body like DHEA and cortisol, excuse me, DHEA and oxytocin that are regenerative to you. It's creating more order and coherence in the energetic field produced by the heart. And it's my belief. That's when more of our, what I'll generically call spirit, 
begins to integrate with our humanness. When we begin to access that larger part of what we are and who we are, when we begin to access the field of information that we call intuition, it's through that ordered, coherent field that that begins to happen more readily and becomes part of our experience as human beings in the moment. It's that simple. Heart focus, heart focus breathing, and then as you do that, activate a heart feeling. And there's your quick coherence technique and what happens when you do it. Makes you feel calm and centered and, and um, at peace. Yeah, and hopefully also kind of aware, you know, not as just a sleepy time state, but one where we become more actively aware of what's going on in ourselves, but in others and in our, in our environment. So have you guys paid attention and, and obviously, but I mean, what kind of results have you seen um, from like a scientific level when people do this practice? Well, we've been doing this a long time now, Nathan. HeartMath's been around for 26 years, and so it's been a huge amount of result that's happened from that. There's been literally tens of millions of lives touched in many and meaningful ways. We've, of course, seen the health benefits that would be associated with something like HeartMath or those type of techniques. Lots of people overcoming health challenges, uh, some physical, like you know, rhythm, tachycardia, those kind of conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure. Also, a lot of psychological changes. There's over 40,000 health professionals in our database that use heart math in some form that have been certified by us or use our technology. They work with people helping them through uh, depression, anxiety, those type of uh, psychological conditions. And so story after story after story after story about that. In organizations, we've seen marked improvements and everything right on down to healthcare cost reduction <laughs> uh, in terms of what benefits can come when you have larger groups of people operating more from a, uh, a more coherent heart output, healthcare, health benefit output is happening in organizations, lots of benefit. So many good things come from that. And, and our, when you look at the HeartMath logo, we're rebranding right now. It's a plus sign and a heart. And what that stands for is add heart. And that's simply what we do here at HeartMath. Our belief is, is that when you add heart or add the qualities of the heart to anything you do in life, it only enhances it. It doesn't compete with anything. It doesn't take away from anything. It just adds another level of, of, of quality. Uh, whether it's you working with your family or your children or your grandchildren or you're doing some big project at a company or you're getting ready to engage in an athletic competition, adding heart just gives you another level of boost that adds quality. So that's what we do. So whether it's through the science, the training programs, the technology, which is the inner balance uh, trainer technology, all of that is just designed to do one simple thing is to get people to add heart to their lives and the lives of others. So that's about as simple as I can get it. And we go through lots of different ways of getting that out and ways of assisting people in that process. And that's our mission. That's what we do. But for me, recognizing uh, now many years later, having you know been a part of this at the very beginning, it all comes down to that. It comes down to just adding heart. And it gets even simpler uh, for me. And that what I've come to know all these years as I've learned to try to develop my relationship to my heart is that, you know, the purpose of life I've, I've come to, to, to realize is to love. The purpose of life is to love. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, uh, how many books I sold, how many places I spoke, how many great interviews I was able to, to uh, great uh, summits I was able to be on, all that will be fun and it will be part of who I am and part of what I leave behind. But the thing that's going to matter the most is simply this. How much did I love and how much did I not? And so heart gives me the ability to love more, which is why I'm into it. I love that. I mean, how, how simple and yet profound. And I think any person laying on their, you know, uh, in their last moments of life and, you know, asking themselves. And, and I mean, we've, we've heard this from others who've been there and said, you know, the last thing I was thinking about was, you know, how much did I give? How much did I love? How much did I make a difference yeah. in the world? And, you know, they're not thinking about how many cars they bought and how big their house was. <laughs> they're thinking about what kind of contribution yeah, they right. made. And, and from that, I mean, just how, yeah, how much love right. can you experience and give? I think that is the uh, most valuable thing we could ever, you know, put our, put our attention on. Well, if there's been one link ever that's been the strongest of all uh, that's been linked to heart, it's love. 
you know, love and heart are like, just like this. And so if we want to love more, if we truly believe that, if any of you listening right now also have a similar feeling and, um, and belief about what life's about, and if you want to love more then what way to, to do it then by connecting with your own best friend, the intelligence of the heart and doing it. And that's what heart mass here to assist you to do. That's our mission. That's what we do for, for our life's work, for our passion. And, um, Check us out, heartmath.com or heartmath.org, and you can learn a lot more about what we do and, and what's available for you that can maybe assist you at adding heart to your life and the lives of others to be able to practice and then to share. Hey, Howard, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and, and your heart today. We uh, truly appreciate it and, and honor you know all your research and, and all your experience that you bring to the world. So thank you so much. Well, Nathan, thank you. I mean, I appreciate the invitation. I never take these things lightly. I'm, I'm honored and privileged to have a, the you know the chance uh, to share my heart with the hearts of others in, in ways like you provide. So thank you for doing what you do. And for everybody who's listening, again, whenever you're listening, wherever you're listening, uh, just know I wish you all the very best and that I wish you a, a deeper connection with your own heart and that uh, a recognition that we're all in this together. We're not alone. We're all going through a very interesting and exciting, but sometimes challenging time in, in global history, but to, that you've always got something you can refer to and go back to as you go through the process. And that's your own best friend, your heart. Take care. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone tuning in, you can learn more about Howard's work and heart math at heartmath.com. Again, thank you all for tuning in to the Unify Summit and I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.